Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. I'm here in Queens, New York, and I'm with Jonathan and your wife, Andlin. Um, they've lived here, well, you've grown up in New York City, I believe. Yeah, and you've been here about 15 years, something like that. So why don't you all just introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about um, your church and the ministry you're involved in here in New York City. Yeah, like I said, I'm Jonathan, and I live in New York, uh, Brooklyn, 15 years. Um, and um, been a part of the Followers of Jesus Sunday Night Church uh, for that time. Uh, we've been married 12 years, and uh, I had particular interest in uh, just reaching the neighborhood for Christ. So that was kind of what kicked off my ministry, if you will, mm -hmm. is, uh, just wanting to share the gospel uh, and see people be saved. Then in 2011, um, I was called to the assistant pastor role uh, there at Followers, which really created a little bit of a shift in my focus because I was doing like boys club type ministry. And as I was doing that, I, uh, my focus started shifting actually in my heart. I had an uneasiness. I said, I don't know if youth ministry in itself or is really an in itself. And if it, I think maybe we need a f more of a like, uh, family ministry. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I said, well, I think that's the church. And so God was drawing my heart toward the church mm -hmm. and then called me into the pastoral role. And um, then in 2017, there was a need uh, f to replace our lead pastor, and I was called into that. And so that's currently uh, mm -hmm. where we're serving. Like John said, my name's Ann Lynn. Uh, my parents are from Haiti, but I was born and raised in Brooklyn all my life. Um, I started going to Followers of Jesus Mennonite Church when I was 11 years old. Um, I'm in my 30s now. And we have four girls. Uh, I stay home with them now, but before that I had a background in social work and I have a background in psychology and child and family studies. So it's pretty interesting that we both have an interest in families and God brought us together and we both have a heart for the church. Yeah, and that transitions very well into what this episode is all about when you're talking about family and church and how those things work together. I actually didn't know you had background in, in social work. Mm -hmm. So you got your master's degree here in New York? Yeah, at okay. Stony Brook University. Okay, wonderful. Something I, that I know you all are really passionate about is relationships within the church, family, especially when it comes to dif different ethnic groups um, across you know, linguistic lines and ethnicities. Just tell me a little bit about that, where that interest came from and what you've observed um, when witnessing those types of interactions, especially in the context of Anabaptist churches. My parents uh, had they were fairly missional. They had experience in Canada with the Aboriginal community. And then they also lived in the South, in Mississippi, for a number of years and built relationships with the black community there. And so for me growing up, a part of my parents' interactions and, and, and friendship was among eth uh, other ethnicities and, and minority groups. Uh, we had uh, Aboriginal families coming through our home. Uh, many years later, these, these relationships were sustainable. Mm -hmm. And then uh, also, uh, when we'd go to Mississippi to visit, I have relatives there, uh, we were also visiting their friends from the black community. And this is many years after they lived there. And so what that communicated mm. to me as a child was that they had built genuine relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also communicated to me that uh, we're all kind of equal, like we're, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're all important. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I think that really was, that was formational for me. And I think it was a, a real advantage for me in terms of my interest in engaging uh, people cross culture, inter, you know, cross culturally. Now, when I moved to New York, I, I think I was a little overwhelmed by it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, so we're in Queens, right? Do you know how many ethnic groups are right here? Um, I think there are over 300 languages spoke <laughs> in uh, maybe this zip code or zip code close by. Ooh, that's incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, New York City, if you want to experience the world it's right, yeah. in terms of Especially ethnic, this neighborhood, I would say. Sort of culture and, and, and people, it's, it's mm -hmm. here. And so I was kind of overwhelmed by that. It just, but I loved it. I love r relating uh, cross-culturally. Uh, so fast forward, uh, I meet my w wife I, and, and, you know, I'm drawn to her because she's, uh, I see qualities in her that I felt were important and were important to me, I was praying about for a wife. And when recording, we're about two months into our courtship and we have our first argument. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, guess what our argument was about? 
uh, it was over whether uh, the Emancipation Proclamation mm -hmm. really was about freeing slaves or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a boy. big argument. <laughs> oh, boy. So yeah. I don't yeah. know exactly what uh, the conversation was, but I felt a need to remind her of the great deed that a Abraham Lincoln uh, mm -hmm. performed in, in, in this freeing of slaves, and she didn't seem to appreciate it at all. <laughs> And oh my, yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so what, what was your response? Well, he was, he was kind of saying I needed, like, you know, he was surprised that I didn't, I mm -hmm. didn't come across as more grateful about it, or, and I was just like, well, it wasn't about the slaves, it wasn't about the black people, it was a political agenda that, mm -hmm. that drove the whole, I mean, like, I think that Abraham Lincoln did have some personal convictions against it, but it wasn't until politics got involved that he felt like a need, that like, mm -hmm. it had to be a push forward. And there were lots of people that were opposed to slavery, but they waited until it affected the nation politically to make something happen. So mm -hmm. it wasn't really something that I was super grateful about. It was like, you should have done it a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that was, uh, all of this is formational. So I went from feeling like I had a healthy experience uh, from my parents and, and the family. Uh, I felt like I could approach uh, cultures fairly non-biasedly. But we get into this argument and now all of a sudden it exposes how I actually understand the world and, and how limited I actually am growing up in a mono-ethnic environment. Uh, and so uh, now we are on a journey together and I have an opportunity to learn. It's interesting because we started dating around my senior year of college. And between high school and college, I, I was very interested in the black experience in America, but not from the history textbook version. like just what do black people feel like their experiences here in America. I've always had the opportunity to be part of diverse groups. Like um, I went to a Catholic school that had Spanish, black, Asian, all different types. I never really thought about differences so much growing up. Mm -hmm. um, but when we moved to, I lived in Brooklyn, we moved to Long Island. In Long Island, I went to a predominantly black school and um, mostly Caribbean, African-American. The teachers there, because of it, of it being a predominantly black school, really wanted to instill a lot of black pride and like about our history but not so much from the textbooks from the way they've experienced it as adults mm -hmm. and so they started teaching us a lot about inequalities and institutional racism and things like that and then i went into college with that interest sparked and studying about people and cultures and things like that and then here we are senior year dating and and I've always had friends from like different backgrounds, mm -hmm. like I said, and then being in the Mennonite church, I've had white friends growing up. But here's this guy that we're interested, that I'm interested in, and we're trying to start this deep relationship, and two months in, we have this big argument, and I'm like, you mean you don't get it? Like, yeah. I have to explain yeah. this to you. And so I, I don't think I had any other friendship that close to me where it got that emotionally intense until we were dating, where it was like, I had challenged something, and he didn't quite get it, and then I had this like moment of, frustration like how do I explain to you something that you actually maybe can't even relate to completely and I don't I can't relate to in some ways because I'm not I didn't grow up in as a slave or something but because I'm a black woman I can identify with the black struggle in a way that mm -hmm. you couldn't as a white man and just we're close though and I want you to identify with my struggle so how do we so we started having those conversations but then because of where I was at in life too those conversations started opening up in my friendships and that's where it got really intense because it can get pretty hurtful when you try to explain a piece of your existence to someone and they just don't get it. And so I started having more and more discussions the more I learned about the black experience in America with white friends in the church and they didn't get it. And it was hurtful, some of the comments that they made or the responses that they had. And they weren't intending to be hurtful, but when you're being shut down with all kinds of arguments, mm -hmm. you do start feeling like it's hopeless. Why are we having this discussion? But in us pushing forward through the discussion, we realize we have to be able to, like, if the church is salt and light, we have to be able to have this intense discussion and still love each other at the end of the day. <laughs> Oftentimes when you have those clashes, it feels like the one side just does not have a box for that thought to fit in. It's just like they just don't even have the capacity to understand where you're coming from. So I'm guessing you faced a lot of that. I'm, well, I'm guessing you still do face a lot of that, yeah. Well, I think because of the, the political climate that we're in, the conversations are just in your face right now. And because of social media, it's, you can turn off your social media and maybe not pay attention to it, but it, 
a lot of how people really feel about inequalities, about oppression, even about just, just racial differences come out because of social media. And I think people actually surprise themselves about how they feel about things. Mm -hmm. We're looking at discussions about immigration, for instance, and seeing Christians comment about keep them out of here. <laughs> and it's like, wait, you're a believer. Don't you care about the child or the family that's suffering? And so how do we come to a a biblical conclusion and love each other at the end of it is really hard. Mm -hmm. Instead of being dominated by the emotional, you know, roller coaster that this country's in, right. say, you're actually, what does Jesus say? Right. Can you just outline for us then what you see in the Bible as far as what God says about relationships between different ethnic groups, different cultures? What, what does God want? And, and how can we actually live biblical when it comes to these issues? For me, part of what I had to come to in the struggle is, is recognizing that differences are okay and they're good. Because I think at some point I started feeling like these differences are just going to keep us separate. And in church history, that's why we have like the African um, Methodist Episcopalian Church. And that's why we have this, like people did start separating because the differences were overwhelming. And I had to find somehow within myself, what does the word say? How do I deal with this in a loving way and not shut people out that I care about because we just can't, we're not on the same page. And the Bible talks about how there's no slave, there's no free, there's no Greek or Jew, there's no male or female. Basically, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I, have to, I do have to remind myself of that. In Christ, we're brothers and sisters. There's no differences. We're family now. And so once I can get into my mind that we're family, um, it's like my brothers or sisters that sometimes we annoy each other, but at the end of the day, we're family. We're still going to be part of the same family, and maybe we don't see everything eye to eye, but we're still family in Christ. And I think another way to like, come at the racial discussion in the church is just the golden rule, like how do we want to be treated? So if I don't perceive inequality, um, that's fine, but if a brother or sister is struggling with inequality, how would I want them to treat me? in that situation. And I think that's some of the ways that we could look at the, the racial discussion within the church. I think also um, there's, I think we can look all the way into the Old Testament um, and see God's heart for all nations. Mm -hmm. And so I think of the Abrahamic covenant um, where God says to Abraham, I'm gonna have, make covenant with you. This covenant really is about uh, a called out people that are willing to portray my righteousness and uh, make my name great and, and walk in obedience to me. And so here in the Old Testament, through even the Abrahamic covenant, we have God's heart for the world to know about him mm -hmm. and for his righteousness to be known. And what he says to Abraham is that through you, through your family, all the families of the world will be blessed. Mm -hmm. And so right there, God reveals his heart for all ethnicities mm -hmm. of the world to be blessed. We move to the New Testament and uh, we see this culminating in Jesus. In uh, Ephesians chapter 2, at the, at the second half of, of Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about this wall that was between the Jews and the Gentiles. Mm -hmm and that Jesus came and broke down that wall. Uh, and it talks about the Gentiles as being alienated from the commonwealth of, of Israel, and that Jesus came and, and breaks down this, this wall. Now, what's significant about this, and what does this division between the Jews and Gentiles have to do with a racial discussion? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it very much has to do with it because this, this wall was certainly an ethnic mm -hmm. wall. It was an ethnic division between Jews and Gentiles. And we see that this practically lived out and worked itself out in the church where as the Jews were coming to faith and the, and the Greeks were coming to faith, the Gentiles were coming to faith, uh, they had a hard time figuring out how to do church together. Mm -hmm. They had a hard time figuring out how to be Christians together. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a hard time figuring out how the Old Covenant, uh, their influence and, and, and that forming their belief system, uh, works in the New Covenant and, and the Gentiles coming in and you know, they're eating their pork. <laughs> like, how can you do this? This is such a disgrace to us, right? And so Paul and the apostles had an incredible job trying to, but, but this, yeah. this was not just a religious discussion. This was 
an ethnic discussion of and, and cultural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so practically speaking, yes, we have this new covenant being, being ushered in in Christ, and he tears down this wall, and, and, and there's a discussion of, of, it is a religious element, right? Uh, but certainly, at a very practical level, there is the, the, a, a very ethnic conflict mm -hmm. at play here. And so uh, I think it's so important that we recognize that it's the heart of God to break down that wall and to say, in Christ, mm -hmm. Uh, like Anlin said, there's neither Greek nor Jew, male nor female, bond nor free. Uh, we're all w w a new man in Christ. That needs to be central to our theology. It needs to be central to our conviction uh, if we're going to be able to uh, navigate hmm. um, these, these tensions. And what that sums up is that the gospel, I think, uh, it should really deals with this issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it should just mm -hmm. completely mm -hmm. change the way we think about the world and how we completely mm -hmm. change how we think about people and how we love people. I think sometimes in these discussions, people say things like, well, I don't see color or, you know, that's not, that's not an issue I have. Like, I look at people the same. And I think when we say neither Greek or Jew, we're not saying that people are just all the same now. We're saying we're part of the same family. And I think part of the healthy part of the discussion is saying we are different. God made us different and it's beautiful. Exactly. It's, it's okay to say that we're different. It's okay to notice the differences, but they're just different. They're not wrong. And I think sometimes there's an underlying belief that different is wrong. We don't realize it until the different comes up against our face and it feels wrong to us because it's different. And so it's okay to say that I'm black and he's white. We're, that we're, we're not uncomfortable about that. We're not saying that that has to separate us but it's a difference that God made and it's beautiful. Uh, one of the things that we fail to celebrate in the gospel is what John, 1 John outlines, that when we walk in the light, we have fellowship mm -hmm. with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And so as uh, blood-washed saints, uh, we should celebrate that we have fellowship. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're also celebrating is our differences mm -hmm. in ethnicity to say that you are made in the image of God mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. are made in the image of God and I am made in the image of God and together we are in Christ. Mm -hmm. We're all partakers mm -hmm. of his redemption. We're all partakers mm -hmm. of his forgiveness because we're all sinners. Mm -hmm. and, we do, and, and together we celebrate who each other is in Christ as God made us. And I think that's the important part because you guys aren't just saying, oh, let's just get this all reconciled and taken care of. You're saying that's actually celebrate the amazing creativity that God has. Mm -hmm. And you said 300 different languages just in this area or, or this zip code or whatever. That is just so cool. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that, is, that shows so much creativity that God has. You know? and, and yeah, I, I think you're right. We need to celebrate that more. My next question would be how, how can God's people celebrate that diversity and use the gospel and the Bible to help bring rec reconciliation and peace instead of um, keeping those tensions alive. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of that specifically in our Anabaptist churches mm -hmm. because we can be blunt and honest mm -hmm. that our Anabaptist churches do not have that much ethnic diversity. Mm -hmm. And I think it is very hard for us. Mm -hmm. I think that when we start to see people how God sees them, we have hearts of compassion then. And when we start to see ourselves how God sees us, we can start to see the pride and prejudice in our own hearts. Mm -hmm. It's only when we are when we are um, using God's plumb line for ourselves that we can see who we, re we really are, it's easy to compare ourselves to other people and say, well, I'm not, I'm not racist, I'm not doing this or that. Mm -hmm. But when you start looking at God's heart for people and what he was willing to do to show his love, we can see that there's pride and prejudice in our own hearts that keep us from being loving towards people. Part of that is being okay with different, like we talked about being okay with differences, but specifically in the Anabaptist churches, one thing that I've felt as a black woman, and I don't think about it at our church so much because we have a little bit more diversity, but when we travel, for instance, I think people in an effort to make me feel comfortable actually make me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> they, they want to make sure that I feel welcome, but they'll say things like, oh, nice to meet you. You remind me of my time in Africa. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I've never been there. That's great. Um, it's almost like me saying, you remind me of wanting to go to Germany sometime. Let's try to connect on just basic human, like, Nice to meet you. What's your name? How would you treat somebody who looked like you? Yeah. And so, like, just even specifically in Anabaptist churches, I think that the struggle is different, is sometimes scary, and people don't want to be seen as scary or weird. They want to be seen as people. 
And so when you approach someone and say, hi, what's your name? Where are you from? We can have a discussion. But when you start talking about your missions trip to Africa, I start feeling a little uncomfortable. <laughs> like, um, Daniel Pollard, who's traveled a lot, people ask me all the time, are you Daniel Pollard's daughter? I'm like, no, I'm not. Oh, I've gotten before, but you're his daughter. Um, or to John, but you're his son-in-law. And John's like, no, I'm not. And they'll push, but you were a Pollard. I'm like, no, I was never a Pollard. Oh, wow. <laughs> and John has had to say there are other black Mennonites. Like it's because his family travels. It's like, that's the yeah. black family. Like it's like, there's no perception that there could be other black people out there. <laughs> like wow. that. Wow. And, and I, I don't, I don't get upset with people about mm -hmm. it. It's just, I notice it. It's their effort to make me feel comfortable. Well, it's almost, it almost just shows we're not used to uh, there, it's almost like we're still getting the right. getting to roll. Like right. we're not used to having to right. confront something like that or, or be used to it. Yeah. So one thing I would say is that uh, Mennonites have a, or the Anabaptist circles have an advantage in that uh, most of us, at least, I, I would like to assume, are are saved or born again, mm -hmm. right? And so um, that already has an advantage in terms of our heart and our attitude, but. There, I, I am very alarmed at uh, how much divisiveness actually comes mm -hmm. out of our circles. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's very important in, for us to understand about this discussion of racism, mm -hmm. the discussion of ethnic biases, uh, is that this is a sin issue. Mm -hmm. hmm. This is not just a social issue. Mm -hmm. uh, we're tempted uh, to just view this as a social problem, mm -hmm. but this is a sin problem. If we just view it as a social problem, mm -hmm. then we can do a couple things. One, we can just retreat from the mm -hmm. issue, just move away from the issue and say, I don't want to get involved. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be in my space and relate within my circles. Uh, the second thing we can do is say, well, this is a problem, and so I'm going to engage it. Uh, and uh, it is a problem, then I'm going to try to find a solution. The problem is, is that we have, if we have just merely a social issue on our hands, uh, then we're going to look for social solutions. Mm -hmm. And we, how do we often do that? We do that through politics, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, we just have to look around us and see that, that uh, at, um, at a political level and social level, uh, we're, we're in chaos. If we view it as a sin issue, which it is, then it affects me, mm -hmm. and I can't escape it. And it mm -hmm. affects you, and you can't escape it. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it draws us to take account for where we stand with this issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we can't retreat. And furthermore, we have a solution. Mm -hmm. And it's not just political. Okay. It's not political. It's, and, and yes, there is, uh, this discussion has social dynamic to it. Mm -hmm. But the solution is found in Jesus, mm -hmm. who actually changed, changes our lives mm -hmm. and changes how we think and changes our desires and purifies us. Mm -hmm. And so we have a viable solution now um, mm -hmm. to deal with this issue. And it calls me to repentance. Mm -hmm. It calls me to love my neighbor as myself. Talking about uh, uh, biblical texts, again, going back to that, Galatians 5. For, brothers, for freedom, you have been set free. Only don't use your freedom as an occasion for your flesh, mm -hmm. but by love serve one another. And so fulfill the law of Christ. The law is fulfilled in our love for our brother. And so I think that's a very critical thing for us to understand. And so when we, when we see uh, all of this negative rhetoric and we see these things uh, emerging on, on social media from within the church mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that are uh, divisive, and hurtful. We're not seeing this as an issue that really touches my life. I don't think at a core we see it as a sin issue. I think when we see it as a sin issue, it's not saying, well, now we don't need to talk about it. It's sin in your life. It's sin in my life. Let's repent and move on. I think what it, acknowledging that it's a sin issue does is that it changes how we approach the problem. So now when there's when I have a perceived inequality that I see happening in the black community and I'm talking to John or a friend about it, when we're having that discussion, how do we have that discussion as believers now? So maybe John doesn't agree with me on that perception, but he would put himself in my position and say, if I were a black man, for instance, how would I feel in this 
social climate. How would I feel about walking down the street, you know, at a certain time of night, depending on the neighborhood? Maybe I don't see that, but how, do, how does it feel for you? I want to put myself in your shoes because I want to be like Jesus. I want to give self-sacrificing love. And so now the discussions are happening, but now I'm looking to see how I can care for that brother or sister. So maybe I don't agree with you, but at least I have compassion. And maybe I don't agree with you, but I want to understand you. And the discussion changes so much. Um, like on, on Facebook, I saw a lot of times when there was all these news stories about young black men being killed by police officers and things like that. It made me really sad to see the discussion within our Anabaptist circles, how it went. I'd see comments like they got what they deserved or they had it coming because they had a criminal history in the past. And I thought, you know, I think I commented maybe in one thread, at the very least, we should grieve the loss of life as believers. Maybe you have a perception of this person and their family, but at the very least as believers, a soul might have been lost. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at it that way and come to this agreement that this was sad, there was a loss of life. How do we become a solution? So if you believe that we, I think we should agree as Christians that blue lives matter and black lives matter, right? But maybe within the church there's this discussion, well, if you say one, you don't mean the other. But I think we should be salt and light and come into the discussion and say both matter. How do I bring these people together? Like in our community, when I see a police officer, I've been teaching my girls and people that are with me, greet the police officer, say hello, say thank you for serving our community. That's one way we can bridge the gap. We don't want to get into the political discussion. We want to be agents of change and healing. And I think it's so different um, to have the idea of social justice than it is to have the idea of compassion and love that Jesus had. Bringing it back to the core of Christianity mm -hmm. instead of trying to just slap a social solution mm -hmm. or a political solution mm -hmm. on it, those seem to be the easy way out. It seems like what you guys are saying is a much deeper um, form of restoration and it'll probably take a lot more work because we have to admit that we have sin in our lives, but it seems like that's much of it, that's an actual real solution. I think that, you know, a very practical way for us as churches um, to, to live this out is, is to just live it out locally mm -hmm. um, and apply, just apply the gospel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we often resort to justice. And, and what we mean, what I mean by justice is figuring out what is deserved for a wrong. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we have the capacity to do that. Mm -hmm. um, God has called us to, um, to serve the least of these. He's called us to love, uh, to, to care for the widow and the orphan. Mm -hmm. Um, that's true religion, <laughs> mm -hmm. and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And mm -hmm. so, um, I think if we can just locally, uh, where we're at, live out the truth, the heart of Jesus, the heart of the gospel, um, we can start seeing small change. It definitely involves us being involved mm -hmm. and having the conversations. But like she said, it's going to be a completely different conversation mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. when we're closed. Uh, with the heart of the gospel. That's the last question I had on my list. Mm -hmm. So is there anything else you would like to add about this? I, I think that a key thing in having the discussions, and maybe this is, maybe you don't have a person that you can have the discussion with face to face, but I think a lot of discussions are happening on social media. And this is just probably social media etiquette. Um, in James, it talks about be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And I think we do the opposite on social media. Like we have no filter say it how you want, when you want, and you just, you're typing because the screen is between you and everyone else. But I think that when we're having discussions, whether it's in person or social media, that we should apply those rules. Listen, and not just listen so that you can say your piece when you're done, but listen to understand even if you don't agree. And be slow to become angry because just remember, people are sharing personal experience. It's not an attack on you. Um, and, and maybe they're just sharing about uh, their pain and they just need you to listen. And so I think to be slow to become angry and um, to listen to each other is a huge thing that we're not doing. And I think social media makes it harder and we have to be more intentional in applying that principle. And I would just also echo that we've had the advantage of 12 years of living together. And for me, learning, uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've become a student 
allowing my wife to help me see her side, mm -hmm. her perspective. Even in, in listening to what we've shared today feels overwhelming or not even sure if it's practical for you. Um, I would say become a student mm -hmm. and uh, as the years go by, God will continue to develop. And as you listen to people, mm -hmm. um, you'll begin to develop new ways of thinking mm -hmm. and new ways of understanding and interacting uh, with uh, your friends uh, cross-culturally. Thanks you all so much. Yeah, you're welcome. This, Thank you. Yeah, Thanks absolutely. Yeah, this has been wonderful. It's a real privilege. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anytime. We'll have to do it again sometime.